Welcome to Trinity Radio. I'm Braxton Hunter, and along with me is Jonathan Pritchett. And we are glad that you are here today on Friday. The week is almost over. Yay! And you get to watch Streaming Church this weekend. So isn't that great? Not um, me, man. But uh, you're going, huh? Uh, if I can, yeah. And uh, we're glad that all of you all have made it. Thank you for showing up and uh, being here with us. And yeah, so um, as we jump into this, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to open up a little bit. So about how I think about things when it comes to videos to engage with. So there's actually another video that, that I thought about covering um, that makes a lot of the same points that are made in this video. I decided not to do that because, and I don't mean for this to sound insulting to any particular person. The only person it could possibly sound insulting to is the person whose video I didn't play. And I'm not naming that person, but um, sometimes certain individuals in the YouTube community can come off as a little bit volatile, um, easily upset, and uh, maybe maybe not quite ready to have their ideas challenged publicly. And I've just found that there are certain um, earmarks of that. And uh, the person whose video I was going to cover had some of those. But when it comes to him at Meta, we've had him at Meta several times before. In fact, last year, last summer, uh, Dr. Pritchett and I and Adam Coleman and Christopher Feather. Did Featherstone come come on there with us? No, uh, MJ Jackson. I knew I knew that uh, Adam Coleman and MJ Jackson and Tim Stratton, I think, was one that came on there. And we 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 talked about the 78 uh, or 78, 78 reasons not to be a Christian or something. And uh, so he can take it. And so we're going to we're going to cover him today. But the reason we're doing this is because Dr. Pritchett, this is going to blow your mind, but. There are some atheists that don't that are upset with me. Yeah. And they're upset with me because I indicated that um, all parents indoctrinate their children. Now, mm -hmm. I did notice that someone already posted, Penn Jammin posted, indoctrination refers to how ideas are shared more than to the fact that they <coughs> get shared. Okay, so that is something that should be considered. If by indoctrination you have bound up into that the negative understanding that it's not just to teach them doctrine, but that it means don't don't ask me any questions, don't challenge what I'm saying to you, uh, don't investigate it for yourself, just believe it because I'm telling you to believe it. Okay, well then, yeah, that's that's you know that's not great. What what I'm what we're saying here is everyone indoctrinates their kids in that everyone's worldview is going to rub off on their kids and everyone is going to teach directly or indirectly aspects of their worldview to their kids. And I'm going to say more about even if you try not to do that, why it doesn't matter 
you're still going to be in, uh, indoctrinating them in the softer sense of that term anyway. And if indoctrination implies that negative sense of the term indoctrination, then I don't think the best Christian parents do that either. But I do think we all do it sometimes. So let's just jump into this. Pritchett, you have anything to say in terms of preliminary remarks? Atheists getting upset with you for quote unquote indoctrinating your children is not shocking. What is shocking since you brought up Adam Coleman is that he likes cheese and shrimp and his grits. And there's been this whole grit controversy going on uh, on Facebook and in the Bodega group lately. And I don't, why are you eating grits? Just shrimp and cheese doesn't even sound good, but maybe you don't like grits. No, I mean, why are you even eating grits if you want shrimp and you want cheese and then tons of butter and sugar? What are you talking about? See, you've missed all of the... the <laughs> what are you saying? This is more shock. That I'm sorry that... Adam, listen to me. You know I love you. But either just eat grits or eat something else. But what you're eating is... Ugh. Okay. Mike Winger says hello to my friends at Trinity Radio. Love you guys. We love you too, Mike. And we're going to be done before you go. And Mr. Phil Fox is with here. Your live and don't get me started on all the stuff that he says he eats in grits. And I don't even think he was joking. Why are we talking about grits? Because everyone's been talking. Where do you live? Oh, yeah. You live in, in, in your super high class, fancy schmancy. I eat grits. Group. Trust me. We eat grits. How do you eat your grits? I'm just wondering how we got on the subject. Because, of because I was shocked that Adam Coleman would put cheese. Did he put that in the comments here? No, it's just something that's been going on. And it, I was reminded when you said, when okay. you brought his name okay. up. All right. And then what Mr. Well, Phil Fox is doing is just beyond the pale. But Okay. Well, uh, how do you eat your grits though? Just straight. No butter, no sugar, no nothing. Yeah, just, just eat gr- it just gr- There you go. That's how you eat grits. grits. I don't mind other people eating it different ways. All right, let's jump into uh, this live. Uh, this, I have it titled live stream. Let's jump into the live stream. We're already in it. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what Hemet Meta has to say about indoctrinating your kids or uh, raising kids. If you're a religious parent, it's very tempting to push faith on your kids as early as possible because you mean well. You think it's good for them. By the way, there are some people saying that their comments, particularly Punchbowl Haircut, is saying that his comments are being deleted. And I just want you to know, I have no idea what that's about. And as I'm looking at YouTube, I'm not seeing where it says comment deleted as it typically would. So it might be a YouTube glitch, but (laughs) Punchbowl Haircut, I can't imagine something that you would comment that I would delete. So uh, anyway, let's keep trucking here. And uh, where'd my thing go? I have no control. There it is. In practice, that might mean you get them baptized shortly after they're born. You get them in Sunday school from an early age so they learn the basics of your religion and so they can learn morality and ethics. You might get them to pray before going to bed. But consider this. That is a bad idea. You don't need to do any of it. And you might actually be better off not doing it, especially if you're not all that religious to begin with. What if you just didn't tell your kids about God? Not yet. What if you waited until they were a little older to introduce them to the concept? Here's why you should seriously consider that. Morality doesn't require God. Do you think your kids won't learn to be kind, honest? Okay, before we go on, uh, Pritchett, I don't know if you noticed, but he's saying, here's why you, should, you shouldn't teach your, uh, tell your kids about God. And especially if you're not really sure about it all anyway. So I'm not actually sure who his target audience is. It could be that his target is someone who's kind of nominally Christian and is just going to teach their kids about God because that's the way their parents well, he's, taught them, but they don't really believe it. Maybe he's assuming that Christian parents don't really believe it. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's where he's using trappings of Christianity, pastor, Sunday school, whatever, but he's not saying Christianity. He's saying religion. religious. And I don't think he was raised a Christian. I think he was raised in Jainism, yeah. Jainism or whatever. Right. But I, but that said, he's talking about Christianity. Yes. That it's clear throughout the video with all the references. Mm-hmm. Decent people unless they're guilt-tripped into doing it? Because morality isn't when you do the right thing because you believe God is watching over your shoulders. It's when you do the right thing even when nobody's watching. Our world is better off when people are helping others without the need for a reward. 
or when they're giving to those who are less fortunate without expecting anything in return, or when they're telling the truth even though they don't have to. Okay, let, let's pause here for a minute. He's not done with the point, but Pritchett, um, here's my thinking on this, and tell me where I'm wrong. He's saying, you know, you, you shouldn't have to tell people, well, God's going to punish you or God's going to reward you or God's looking over your shoulder. It's better if you, and first of all, let's understand as we're talking about morality here, and this is a typical point made with values and duties and atheists really don't like it when you point this out because it's one of those arguments or facts or points that they think that has been debunked for a long, long time. It hasn't been debunked. If atheism is true, there is no ultimate value. There is no ultimate purpose, which means valued terms like better are meaningless. So to say it would be better if people did X, not if your worldview is true. Um, that said, uh, well, all he's saying is I'd like it more and a lot of people would like it more. Right. Mm -hmm. But he here's the thing. Cri yes. Christianity talks about um, punishments for, for, for certain things and rewards for certain things. But when I, let's say, don't steal uh, something from the gift rack at Starbucks, Bridget, it's not because I think that um, it's not because I'm thinking about some reward I'm going to get for having not stolen it. Or, or if I help or a little old lady across the street. Yeah, or the omnipresence of God. It's not that right? I'm worried about the fact that God's watching over me. Now, right. if I think deeply about the nature of why I don't steal, uh, I'm going to think of a lot of things. One of those things is going to be, this, and, and principle for me is this is not what God created me for. This is not what God once for me, but that's not, the, but, but to speak directly to the point that he's making when it comes to our everyday experience, if he's saying, look, if you raise kids just to be nice people, they'll just be nice people and they won't be doing it so that they don't get punished or get a reward. That's true about Christians too. We're not doing things thinking about the reward. When mothers raise their children and love their children and want to be good parents, they're not trying to be good parents be, just because they hope that God's going to reward them for that or that they'll be punished if they're not a good parent. They're doing it for the same reason that good atheist parents are doing it, which is they love their kids. So it's it's not, and this is a common trope that goes around in the atheist community is that, well, you're raising your kids about, you know, thinking about God because you, if, and they're going to grow up to become a group of people who only ever do the right thing because they want to reward or avoid punishment. And that mm -hmm. is just a straw man. That's not the way it is. And that should be self-evident if you've known Christians in your life. Right, Pritchett. I, I don't think you're wrong. I will say that the church does actually need to bring back a more robust theology of uh, rewards and punishment and consequences and, and things like that in our actions here. And the you don't even hear much about that. So, so yeah, it's kind of a trope and it's, it's kind of a character, caricature. But at the same time, I, I think that theologically speaking we could talk more about <laughs> rewards than we do uh, in churches but that's not that's still never the motivating factor because all of our crowns that we get we cast at jesus feet anyway when we get to heaven it's all because of him anyway so th it's it's real shallow um but I, I do think that the the idea that i walk around thinking i need to do good because i can get something i get a trinket i get it, no one really thinks that way about the moral decisions they make on a day-to-day -day basis. Because mo most decisions aren't really, uh, what would you call earth-shaking or, or, or life-altering decisions on, on a regular basis. You make hundreds of moral decisions that, that really you do because of the type of person that you are. And you're not really thinking about all of these other things. But when I, when I think about raising my kids, the, the, you, the accounting job that God does in heaven for the lists, uh, you know, the, the naughty list and the good list or whatever, that doesn't even factor into it, you know? We right. teach, when, when, when Christians teach moral principles, number one, we teach that there's an objective founding for morality that is in the God that we worship, and two, the wisdom in living in a certain way that lives in harmonious, uh, you know, setting yourself in with, with God and with create the created order of things and how that brings more... Uh, through the wisdom tradition, how that, that brings a more beneficial way of, of living out your life um, in light of creation, in light of the fall, in light of a holy God, and why certain things and courses of action are better than others. We, we teach all of that. Um, and it's not about, you know, you get, though I will also say what's wrong with, like when you're raising your young kids, what's wrong with rewarding their positive behavior 
um, and then giving them consequences for negative behavior. Well, yeah, now that's what I was going to say. Everyone does this with their kids at some point growing up. You reward them for good things. You punish them in some way for bad things. And uh, and I mean, that that's a part of how we grow up. Um, So it's not I mean, you can't trash that completely. But obviously, Christian parents do not hope that their children will turn out to be the kind of person that him and it is describing. Um, but you know what? Eddie Vasquez, uh, as usual, said everything that we just said in a much simpler way. Yeah, this atheist doesn't have a grasp on Christian motives. Right. Which is the, which is the and the guilt thing. thing. He mentioned the guilt thing. You know, do you uh, he, later on? Because we've seen the video, he gets into something that's actually meaningful. And then he poo poos that, too. Uh, as far as guilt, I don't try to guilt my kids. And I think guilt's the most useless thing in the world. Um, so I don't, I don't try to use guilt as any sort of motivator of anything. Uh, but then when he brings up shame, we'll talk more about that and why that I, I think he's dead on wrong about that. But yeah, I, I agree with him on the guilt thing because I think guilt's useless. Guilt is self-serving. It's self-assuaging. If I do something bad, if I feel guilt over the bad thing, that makes me feel better about myself because a good person would not feel good about doing a bad thing. They would feel bad. So I can't be that bad of a person, even though I did a bad thing because yeah, I feel it's, guilty. It's, and look at me. I feel so bad. Yeah, that is self-serving. Useless. Guilt is absolutely yeah. useless. Don't care how guilty you are. I care about do you repent and change your behavior because that's what God cares about. I don't care about how much you wallow in self-pity and guilt. Yes. It's useless. And, and as I discussed with respect to my wife, when we were talking, when I was giving my uh, kind of life story the other day, um, one of the greatest things was when, when she became a Christian, she said, you know, before I used to feel guilty for things that I did, but this is a completely different experience. The conviction of the Holy spirit yeah. that I'm feeling, which, um, mm. second Corinthians chapter mm. seven says is a godly sorrow that God works in you. Um, that works repentance, not to be repented of. In other words, it works repentance and you should be glad about that. Right. Guilt um, doesn't do any, doesn't do much good because that's, I'm not talking about legal guilt. I'm talking about emotional guilt. Emotional guilt is just a self-serving uh, thing to let you know, oh, I feel bad because I did. So. It, it never prevented you from doing the thing, right? You didn't feel guilty while you're doing it. You felt guilty afterwards. Yeah. And maybe so, only because you got, guys. so here, here's one of your favorite useless. people, Jonathan. And I think you're going to be on his show again very soon, right? No, I was on his show last Sunday. You missed it. But okay. Uh, um, and Mr. Phil Fox, thank you for that super chat. Yeah. Thank you so much. He says, love you guys. When did you guys become the coolest cats on the interwebs next to Mike Winger? Of course, I've been <gasps> blessed true. by Trinity radio. Mike Winger is cooler than us. I don't but, mind it. But Mike yeah. is, I, I often say about Mike and I say it again now that he's having people like that in my life is a wonderful thing because he represents a person who I, who has qualities that I would like to emulate. Exactly. And uh, that's a, and that's true of you, Pritchett too. Um, it is now they're not the same qualities but <laughs> no <laughs> but no. they are qualities it, mike winger when um, i when i think of when i think of how to how you know not to set the guy on a pedestal he's he's not perfect he'll admit that but what does living out holiness look like in public that's mike winger yep all right let's keep trucking here that's to us be a need to. religion for that even kids understand that seriously just teach them the golden rule Treat others the way you want to be treated. That's a good substitute for all things religious, and God has no part in it. Better yet, teach them the platinum rule. Treat others the way they want to be treated. Okay, now this is a Hitchens thing Mm -hmm. that has been said for a long time. You made a good point about it a while ago, Pritchett. Break it down. Well, number one, I mean... Doing to others as you would have them doing to you is a golden rule. It didn't originate with Christianity, but it was repeated by God. So it's obviously something that you should take into account. And God said it himself because Jesus is God. Number two, treat other people the way they should be treated. Okay, everyone, including him, look, the way I want to be treated is I want each of you to empty the contents of your wallet and give it to me every time uh, you run into me. And if you don't see me in person, I want all of you to empty your bank accounts into the Trinity Radio uh, Patreon account. That's how I want to be treated. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, you know, and no, plus, there are good. some ways that people might want me to treat them that actually would be immoral. Right. Exactly. You know, so, you know, so that that's that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, plus, along with uh, the Christian message, I mean, th- these are the you know, when Jesus says the gold gives you the golden rule. Part of that is you're going to be living Christianly. Yeah. And so because of that. 
uh, you know, doing unto others what you would have them do unto you all works out in all the details because all of the details are bound up in ultimately what all of it boils down to, which is love. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's, let's keep, Oh, and yeah. some people are into weird stuff. I don't, I don't want to treat them the way right. they want to. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but here's another thing about it. Here's another thing about it. That's why you needed an and objective I'm saying this standard. because I'm a little bit scared where you're going to go with that. But um. no, I'm not going to say more than that. I'm just saying that's why we need an objective standard that's independent of us. And that's why I think it's actually good yeah. to have a holy book that God wrote. Right. Uh, to teach your kids because it's true. But, but, but here, but here's um, something that, uh, that, um, that he said a moment ago. He said, you don't need religion for this morality. Now, He's not making this point, but I want to just say this. If you ever get the chance to watch the movie Collision, and I think it's free on YouTube, which is a series of discussions between Chris, the late Christopher Hitchens and um, Doug uh, Wilson. Wilson. And, and they're, they're in various places, and they discuss a lot of the same things in multiple places throughout the movie. And then watch Hitchens' debates, and you'll see it as well that Hitchens often characterized the moral argument that is given by people like William Lane Craig and Doug Wilson to be that Christians, because of religion, are going to be better people than atheists. And I know you have thoughts on that, Pritchett, but table those. The, the, the truth is, that is never what the moral argument that Craig and Douglas Wilson are bringing. They're saying you don't have a foundation. It's not that you can't act morally. It's that you don't have a foundation to, ex you don't have an explanation. Right. It's epistemology for versus ontology. Christianity has both the ontology and explains why you can have an epistemology to discover these uh, moral values and duties that deep down as William Lane Craig, we all know it. It's objective. Right. And so, right so he wrong. says you don't need religion for morality. You don't necessarily need religion to do good things and to understand moral truths, but you need, that's the epistemology, to understand moral truths. You do need, as, as Pritchett was saying, you do need God to explain the ontology, the, the foundation for these moral principles. And so on multiple levels, what he's saying here doesn't work. Respect them. The online version of that, by the way, is only say things in a comment thread that you would say face to face, and if we all knew your real name. Got it, YouTube? And if that's too much work, how's this? Wait a minute. Be nice. That's it. Has he actually gone outside and talked to people? Five, ten years ago, we used to always say, people say things online they'd never say. For no, when you start interacting with people, oh, especially, uh, you know, uh, if you do street evangelism. No, people say uh, they, they'll talk to you the same way they talk online. That whole facade is gone. People have no manners anymore. They'll they'll say the the, the type of stuff. Uh, unfortunately, theology geeks too. Yeah, you get a bunch of Arminians and Calvinists together and watch what happens. Yeah, that's the tweet. Kids get that too. That's all of morality. They're more likely to be nice if they understand why it makes. That's not all of morale. Here again, Jesus trumps him at Meta. No small feat. <laughs> um, I mean, no no large feat. I guess I mean to say. Uh, for Jesus, because what, what's being, what, what he just said is it all boils down to being nice. No, it all boils down to love. Again, I can be nice to you and then talk trash about you behind your back. Yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can, uh, be nice to you. And even if I don't talk trash in my heart, feel horrible things about you. But if I would love you, if it all boils down to love the message of Christ, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, you have to change the way you internalize and think about other people. Right, because, because even to hate your brother, right, right is to commit murder. In right, your heart. So this is, uh, you know, Jesus wins is the bottom line. Right, Sense. to everything. Yeah. Instead of well, go ahead. Well, I mean, here's the thing. It's no secret that I'm naturally disposed, you know, disposed to think certain ways about certain people, even if I never verbalize it. Oh, the things I don't say out loud on Trinity Radio or. Trinity Radio Extra or anything else. Yeah. Oh, you all would love to see. No, you wouldn't. It's, you would it's love not to good. see it's not good. some of the really um, colorful and directly applicable points that Pritchett makes mm -hmm. before we turn on the camera that it, that are better than the when I say, no, 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 you've got to make <laughs> right. that more family friendly. <laughs> right. So, so what I'm saying is, you know, I don't think, I think that changes you when you have to constantly battle yourself to think, positive things about people you genuinely don't like and think differently about things that you want to say that you cannot communicate that way because that's not how a Christian should speak, right? Um, 
to me, that seems to be a higher moral ethic to think in your private. He says morality is what when no one's looking. Yeah, morality is where no one can get to inside your head. I mean, how much deeper does it go when you have the Holy Spirit constantly checking your internal thoughts? You know, it's crazy, and it makes. But but the discipline, the spiritual disciplines in Christianity, to teach you to constantly check yourself and to always look for the good and the true and the beautiful and you know even if you can't go further than the imago day and someone else right and find it yes and and, and come to a place of peace, that changes you morally and, and you progressively get better we call it sanctification and i yes. think that's a that's a good thing amen and financially demonstrating that jesus wins yeah uh jimmy scott despain gives us seven 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 uh dollars super chat uh, thank you so much, Jeremy Despain. That means so much. If, check out his channel, folks. If a majority of atheists are hard determinists, why are they concerned about the choices of parents to teach their children anything? Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna steal man the determinist position here. There are Christian determinists and atheist determinists. Uh, I'm we're not determinists, uh, but um, the determinist would say something like, "Well, because um, what even if I'm determined to teach my children certain things, and even if they're determined." to think and respond and do certain things as a result. Um, I'm, I might, I might be the determinative cog that leads to them acting a certain way. Right. And so that's, that's how all that. Plays and they'll out. say, and aren't I lucky that the chain of dominoes landed to where I'm the type of person that would teach them my high moral standards. Yes. Right? But of course the only reason Instead of you, determined to teach them, uh, which is what, which is the moral equivalent of determinism of teaching them to chop up babies. Right. I mean, you just got, it's you just got lucky that. that well, all even them. if it's not the moral equi right. equivalent, as I always say, it could still be on atheism. It it's is still well, not, not yeah, on, on atheism, on yeah. determinism. Yeah. It, it it would still you could perhaps still say it was wrong, but it's moot morality. It's like right. if I find myself being the kind of person that would be a racial hater versus the kind of person who would work for uh, racial equality. Either way, I, it's just the luck of the draw. Yeah. It's whatever determined. But, and your thinking that you're a good person for raising your kids a certain way, those views about whatever is moral there are the views that you're determined to hold. And so you can't really know, you can't get outside of the determinism to assess it. Well, that's what I like about the atheist determinants, though, because you 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 spell out all the implications to them and they're like, yeah, so, right? You do that to a that's Calvinist and don't like the consequences of their ideas, right? They, they, but but at least atheists, it's like, yeah, it's pure rant. But yeah, I mean, from our perspective, pure, this deterministic chain that led them to be horrible and whatever. Yeah, it's too bad for them. But, you know, so I, I can't find the comments, put it on the screen. But uh, black, yeah, sure, I can. Um, black Tuesday film says, do you believe moral obligations and determinism are incompatible? No, I just think it's a. I think they're practically incompatible. I think yeah. it's a moot point. You can say, like, let's say you have an atheist determinist here. Now, we don't believe you can have actually, ultimately objective morality on atheism. Right. But let's just say that you could. Let's give you that for the sake of argument. Again, whatever I find myself doing is what I was determined to do. So if I find myself doing the objectively moral thing, well, high five. If I find myself doing the objectively evil thing, well, that's that's just what happens. So this is one of the reasons why it makes no sense to you can hold people responsible counterintuitively, like you can put them in jail for something. But as Leighton Flowers would say, they are not response able, right? They, well, they, I like what, what, what he says is you, they're punishable, but they're not responsible. Right. And you, can, you can't put the, the point is they're not praiseworthy or blameworthy. Ultimately, yeah. they're just a thing that did a thing and you like it or don't like it. But right. that's just the way it is. And there's something else I wanted to get to here because I love this. Thank you, um, Marv Alice, for that uh, uh, super chat. That means Marvelous. so much to us. Oh, Marvel. Ah, ah, Woo. <laughs> man. But I'm so it, but, glad you're here. Okay. Um, but I, I, I'm guessing Alice is somewhere part of the... I mean, uh, Maybe she's married to Marv. I don't know. But maybe she, she likes to go by Marv. We don't know. I bet she'd like her uh, super chat read. Yeah. She says being nice <laughs> has nothing to do with morality. Serial killers are nice. Nice is a standard, not a virtue. Absolutely. What do they Thank always you. say when they catch a serial killer? The person that lived next door to them, what do they always say? They're so nice. He's such a nice guy. Yeah. Why am I having more fun with this super, this uh, live stream today than I typically would? All right, let's get back to him at okay. Meta. You're doing it because you tell them it's one of God's special rules. You don't need religion to teach morality. Religion invites... Well, okay, now, first of all, um, 
this is like the whole thing of did people not know it was wrong to to uh, commit adultery before it was given on Sinai? Like, of course, they they were aware of moral principles. This is now um, a a um, a formalizing of God's uh, plans moral for law. His people yeah. of his of his moral law, right? And uh, and and that's uh, I think that's an important piece of this. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the the thing is, it's yeah, maybe one of God's rules. But here's the other thing: in the specifics of morality, there are specifics. For example, we argue about things politically because we disagree morally about things. And in the specifics of morality, you do need some more detailed laws about that. I mean, right. for example, if I'm driving through a city I've never been in, and the speed limit is 35, and I think that it's 50. Um, there's nothing within me that, that, that tells me that it's 50, that it's 35, right? I I'm, I'm unsure. I might say, well, you know, I, I, I have impressions that if I'm driving 10 miles an hour on the freeway, that's not right. Or that if I'm driving 80 miles an hour on a country road, that's not right. But this is gray. And I would like some greater clarity on this. And so, uh, that's an important thing. Yeah. All right, let's go. Shame. Shame. Oh, Pritchett, you love talking about shame. So much of religion, especially Christianity, Catholicism, involves telling people that without God, they're worthless. They are sinners. They're unsaved. They're lost. They have a God-shaped hole in their heart. Basically, there is something wrong with them. That's never been true. But what a horrible thing to tell your children. For them to believe they're wretches in need of supernatural intervention. It's even worse to tell them Jesus was murdered because of something they did without even realizing it. That, that did, no, that, what that demonstrates is their worth, right? Not, not their worthlessness. Oh, right. They were worth, yeah. they, God valued, the, now it's, it's sacredness, it's an ascribed thing, but we are image bearers, and so we, we actually have our worth. Now, if you're an atheist and there's no ultimate values, then ultimately there is no worth. Yeah, there's no you uh, and the 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 cat. Just like they say, the if you boiled down all your chemicals yeah. into their component parts or whatever yeah. and gave them to a scientist, they'd be worth like two bucks or something. Right. But even that is uh, subjectively decided upon value. Like, <laughs> right. It's like it's like you're not worth anything. Ultimately. Yeah. If atheism is true, right. if Christianity is true, you have worth. You're made in the yeah. image of God. Now, I I will say it's fair to say because some people just have worm theology all day long. They take hyperbolic statements about uh, humanity, normally given in times of like uh, Elizabeth Maines. You're talking yeah. about people like Elizabeth Maines who says they are little monsters. Yeah. Is that the kind of person uh, you're talking and, about? And think that that's all that Scripture ha- and preachers don't do a good job. You know, giving this one-sided worm theology about their anthropological views of man that they think is biblical. Actually, you're talking about Paul Washer. Right. Um, Paul Washer in the American Gospel guy says that man is worthless and the cross shows the seriousness of sin and wasn't about love. Right, that's stupid. Stupid. Um, it's, a, it's a great half-truth where the hyperbole is dialed up to 11 and they stay there constantly. That's imbalanced, it's unbiblical, and it's nonsense. And so I understand some of this. Uh, pushback on that, um, but there. But again, that's you. You have to balance that out. But there is a bit that, yeah, wretched sinner. Okay, uh, and that Jesus saved a wretch like me. We all sing that. Um, young kids don't, in my view, understand the seriousness of their sin in light of a holy God, um, and not just their individual sins, but the sins of of, of communities and and everything else. Um, and, and just the fallen order of things. Okay, they don't recognize that as kids anyway. So well, let's talk about not, that though yeah. for a minute. When it comes to original sin, I can't blame him at Meta for this because one of the most uh, talked about expressions of Christian understandings about original sin is that you are not only born uh, with a, and this is, I like this, I think this expresses all of Christianity in part, but it is from the, Baptist faith and message, but it says you, you, what we inherited from Adam was a nature and environment inclined towards sin. Now, no Christian is going to disagree with that if they're really a Christian, Mm -hmm. but then what many Christians say in addition to that is that you're also born guilty and personally guilty of what Adam did long before you were ever born. And atheists often 
you know, criticize that. And I understand why they criticize that. Many of my Christian brothers, perhaps in the chat, do hold that position. Well, I'm not here to beat you over the head about it, but I am here to say that I think we do inherit a nature and environment inclined towards sin from Adam. And we do know because of Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all will sin. But that you have a sin nature, a nature and an environment that inclines you towards sin, is a different concept from you having a guilt nature, being personally culpable for Adam's sin. Now, um, everyone will do their own sinning, and and yeah. you are certainly culpable for that. And so, I, you know, when it comes to kids, I think people in the chat that are making this point are making a really good point that, yeah, you watch kids too very long, they'll start understanding what right and wrong is, and they'll do enough for their own right and wrong, right? Yeah. Um, so that's I, yeah. When it comes to original sin, I, I like you. I don't believe in original guilt uh, on on that whole thing. Even though, as I always point out, you know, you have uh, a whole you know millions and millions of your own sins to account for. Having one more from Adam dumped on you is not really uh, okay. But I mean, at the same time, I don't believe it because I don't think that's what the Bible's teaching. We're born with a death nature, and that and sin reigns in death, and that's what Paul says. So, mm -hmm. but. But this idea about worthlessness, uh, I don't. I, if if Jesus dies for humankind, that tells me that humankind is some value. So I don't. I don't like worthless language with respect to human beings bearing the image of God. Now, sinful, wretched, yeah, and, and you know you can do the psalmist and you can ramp up that that hyperbole like Paul does and. Uh, the content of Romans three, all of that. Yeah. It, but you got to balance that out. I, I get it that Paul Washer and others aren't really well, known actually, for that. Actually, but, let's, let's throw this up here by yeah. way of, uh, of repairing that uh, little comment. Uh, that was what someone had put up as a comment, but Justin Brown says, I think Paul Washer's sentiment was straw man in the comment. Pritchett replied to not that you, uh, yeah. were you were already in mid sentence replying to people that feel that way no i've so I've, I've actually heard worthless language i've heard this world is trash and it's going to be dis you know completely discontinued which of course is sits odd with actual christian eschatology i but you know frumpy paul washer and i i mean he says some stuff that's okay but no he if his position was straw man he, paul washer earned it because paul washer is the the guy who who mean mugs and and is prone to hyperbolic rhetoric all the time. He ramps that up. So th that sentiment is not a straw man, even if that's not his exact words. So I'm, I'm going to bail out our commenter because, I mean, Paul Washer just, that's his, that's been his shtick that made him famous. Well, uh, sometimes you have to kick back against that because well, it's let, let out me of just, balance. Let me just say, while you've just done a very Pritchett full job there, <laughs> that I'm actually wearing... Uh, Jonathan Pritchett shirt that says that's enough pseudo intellectual blather. Yeah. And by the way, if you'll just look below the YouTube video you're watching right now, you'll notice that there are t-shirts and stuff there. And yeah. one of them is that t-shirt, which is our best selling t-shirt. No, the, the other one, the, the, the pseudo pious sanctimonious blather that, and that's the better one than the pseudo intellectual, because that's the one that you wear to in, 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 that's the that's the shirt that you point to when Paul Washer's speaking because sometimes he gets off on that. And I, I'm not I don't I don't dislike Paul Washer personally, but he does carry that. And you know what? I even saw a Paul Washer video once where he said, "The one thing I didn't do in my career is talk enough about the love of God." And but yet we never saw him ever do anything with that. So, uh, or at least not that I've seen. But I stopped <clears throat> watching him long ago because there's not much value there. All right, let's get back to him at Meta. Died for your sins. Don't, don't do that to them. Trust me, they will get older and they are going to feel shame about everything. Okay, now understand, that's the point. At some point, people are going to experience shame. Let's say they're 18 years old, because almost all 18 year olds by that point have experienced shame about something or should have experienced shame yes. about something. And we hope so, they do. Let, let, so, so now here's the thing. What do you want? Do you want them to have been raised to that point to understand? Look. Uh, you're going to experience shame in your life. You're going to do things that are wrong. You're going to do things that break God's commands and what God wants and what God created you for. But everyone does that. Look here in the Bible. It says Romans 3.23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. I've done that. Your mom's done that. We've all done that. Um, even the greatest preacher you know has done that. And you know what? Um, there is, a, that's a, it's not okay that you did that, but there is a way out of this because Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And listen to me, internet, the sins of every single individual on the face of planet earth who has ever lived or ever will live. And as a result of that, you can, 
uh, be saved. You can be forgiven. He will take your shame. And so uh, that's the message I want to hear rather than uh, snowballing, not preparing them for the shame that's going to come when suddenly they're 18 years old and now they feel like they're just a horrible person and now they develop all kinds of problems as a result of that. Yeah, I, the biblical culture is an honor-shame culture. Shame, I'm all for it. Guilt, throw that in the trash. But shame, I, I hope that people feel shame when they do bad things, right? Because shame is actually a powerful motivator to, one, prevent people from doing bad things, and, and two to correct the bad thing that they did because if they're especially if it's public say now if it's just shame inside the family and of course in the ancient world you tried to cover up all the shame so it wasn't exposed beyond the the kin but but if you had to you would do it but public shame and humiliation is a powerful tool for corrective behavior not just for the person who committed the offense but anyone who views the consequences of that shameful behavior so shame is good for preempting immoral behavior and it's good for correcting immoral behavior both in you and others so that they are you know did you are you responding to this um wait guilt is useless but you want people to feel shame absolutely go i just explained why he's saying let me nutshell it for you guilt is something you feel and then you get to feel good about yourself that you felt it because bad people wouldn't feel that guilt over what you just felt and it's ultimately self-serving in that sense and it's just a natural part of your makeup but shame is a different animal yeah shame is a powerful motivator to prevent immoral behavior and to correct immoral behavior in both the perpetrator of the immoral behavior and others who witness uh, the consequences of that behavior in a public way um, that's and in fact I mean most of the modern world uh, outside of the West is still honor shame cultures and uh, you know it's just I think it's it, that just works better yeah we, we I mean not that we don't have shame in, in our culture, we do. It's just we. What happens when somebody does something? They go and you know. For Hollywood, it's we're, I'm going to rehab. You know, for politicians, they come out with the Mia Copa apology and they talk about how horrible they feel to Diane Sawyer or whoever the person is. Now I'm probably giving away my age, but I don't know who they. Diane Sawyer. She's oh, from is Louisville. she still doing it? No, I'm just saying. That. No, I'm just saying when you go on the program and and grovel and talk about how guilty you felt and how bad you feel. That does nothing to correct your behavior. Right. And now what we get, and I'm not, I'm not a mental health professional and there are certainly times where medications might be necessary. I'm on medications, but the fact is we, what through medication or through uh, just speaking about it um, and counseling people, it almost seems like sometimes what's going on is we've got to help you feel better about what's going on rather than resolve what's going on because what you did was crummy. Yeah. Not always. Okay, let's get back to him at Meta. You don't need to pile on from birth. Let kids be curious. Now, before we get into let kids be curious, what, did I pause it already? Is that what you're laughing at? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're gonna, this is going to be two shows, I can tell. No, 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 it's not. We just may not get through everything that he says, right. but, uh, but I, I did want to say one of the, there was another video. There were multiple videos I looked at and one of the videos I looked at, the person was saying, well, you know, one of the things is let kids be curious and let them be familiar with apps, get them educational apps. There are all these people out there that don't want their kids to have an iPad and don't want their kids to use apps. And I'm thinking, okay, now this is an atheist video. So even though this person isn't specifically saying they're talking about Christian homeschool people, uh, the truth is those people are often pretty, uh, you know, hardcore Christians. And, uh, where did my, where did my screen picture go here? And then I'm like, it's not like that Christians running moms of faith, edgy, honest, and real wouldn't make an article, 10 best apps for homeschoolers and giving you a number of educational apps, uh, that are not even some of them Christian. So, um, I, th- I think there's like, what is this idea that we, what do outsiders think goes on in Christian homeschool and Christian? I don't know, school? but our kid, our Christian kids in my homeschool are reading pagan literature and books that they're now saying are horrible. And they, they like want to get rid Seuss? of Dr. Seuss. Well, no, not, not Dr. Seuss, <laughs> but just there's a whole bunch of nonsense, uh, because in, in the humanities around the country right now, and a lot of it comes out of these social science departments, and when uh, you know, the, just whining about uh, you know the the Western canon, uh, some of the critiques are valid, most of them aren't, and you know I'm just saying we don't 
who's are the ones that are exposing their kids to the widest range of ideas? Well, it turns out it's uh, Christian the, homeschooler people. Well, yeah, and unfortunately, we're leaving it to mostly the Calvinists because they they seem to be on top of that more so than they're doing a lot of that. They're doing a lot of that, and we're doing a lot of we're that. We're doing it. We're a couple Orthodox of non-Calvinists. Yeah, here. I know, but I'm just saying they're on. I mean, top. we're not doing it, but our yeah. wives are. Uh, well, I like to I like to break. Up. We do. We teach the Bible, right? That's yeah, what we teach. We, uh, <laughs> yeah. right, and and the wives it. teach all the godless pagans. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm good. I hope you're not watching. Honey. Get, she doesn't watch this. Are you <laughs> no. kidding? Let's get back to Kids it. Kids should never grow up thinking God did it is an acceptable answer for anything. What if the answer to the question is God did it? Right now. Yeah, God did it is an ultimate answer. Is dad did it ever an answer to a question? Who took the trash out? Dad did it. Yeah. Okay, there are some things that if God exists, God does. And from this point on in the video, if it hasn't already been obvious, he's he's just presuming the falsehood of Christianity to begin with. Right. But I, I want to say this. Saying God did it, he, and I'm going to preempt it. We just need to save time anyway. I'm going to preempt what he says. Look, uh, and we can skip it. At the end of the day, God did it is not the end of the discussion like this guy wants to assume it is because God did it is an ultimate answer. It's not an explanation of how God did it, which is the inquiry of science and philosophy and everything else. So I have never seen curiosity killed because of the answer God did it that Richard Dawkins wants to trademark. Never once. That, 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 see, this is, goes back to the comment earlier that they don't understand— you need to come live in our world. Yes, I'm sure you can find the worst fundamentalist, you know, backwoods people in Alabama that don't want to hear. Sorry, Alabama. Uh, Why are you dissing Alabama? Okay, you're from West Arkansas, Virginia. Bro. You know, it's almost heaven. <laughs> is anyway. that the thing? If you're from uh, Arkansas, the only state you can diss is Alabama. Yes, it used to be Mississippi, <laughs> but then they got the casinos and their roads got better than ours. So, I mean, so it, I'll it, diss it, them it, for their casinos, right? But I'm just saying, God did it. Has never stopped inquiry at all. I don't. It's, that's stupid. But he does, you know. Anyway, go ahead. You upset you Kit play. Horton. He's from Montgomery, Alabama. I love Alabama. No, it's too late. No, they they <laughs> win all the. You taught your Alabama worm theology. Mm-hmm. All right, now let's go on with. Oh, you want to? I'm skip sure this. all of us were annoyed when our parents responded to our questions with "because I said so." No, that's okay. a good answer too. Everybody has said that to their kids or an equivalent to that. You may have tried. Okay. I made a commitment, Pritchett, and I'm sure you did too, that when my kids asked me questions mm-hmm. that, 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 that I thought were valuable, needs to be answered, you know, those kind of things, I, I try to answer all their questions. Even mm-hmm. if they ask me why I did something, you know, you know, around the house, I try to a- answer those questions. I feel like that's good. I agree with atheists, and I think atheists are wrong that Christians don't try to operate that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, not, I'm speaking in generalities here. However... Um, that there, if you try to answer every question, your kid, have you ever had a five-year-old in the house? Yeah. The eight-year-olds are the most philosophically minded of all people. When else are you going to have a kid, a person walk up to you and say, I wonder what it would like to be a, be a tree. I've thought about that today. What, what if I was a tree? You know, the, if they start, they're going to start asking you questions. Why, why, why? One of the things we used to keep that we kept this kid when he was five years old, um, named Noah, who was a friend of the family. And, and he was sitting in the back seat and he pointed at the dashboard as we were driving down the road. And he said, what's that? I said, that's the speedometer. He said, why? I said, so we know how fast we're going. He said, why? I said, so I don't get a speeding ticket. Why? Cause I like my money. That's why. Mm-hmm. Where are we going? Well, we're going to a gas station. Don't ask me any more questions. Well, are they going to have a swimming pool there? A swimming pool? Probably not. Well, if they do, can we go swimming? No. Why? I mean, this is how kids are at a certain age. And you're going to get to a point as any parent where one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to say, stop asking me any more questions right now, or you're going to keep trying to answer them and ultimately explode in frustration, which is less healthy. Right. You cannot answer all your kids' questions. And sometimes there are times, and that doesn't kill the curiosity. They'll still ask questions. But uh, sometimes, because I said so, is a sufficient reason and no further dis- in the real world bosses like braxton hunter will out tell me to do something and if i say why you know he's like I, you don't need to know why just go do it and by the way i could probably get it done faster than he could explain why he needs it done why don't i just go do it 
Amen. And, and get it over with, right? Bosses do that. Employers do that. All kinds of people say, because what? I said so. And they don't have time to go into everything with you when you want to answer. But what about when you, tell, when you tell me that? Because you never even care why, though. I mean, you, you say <laughs> why, and it's like, I can explain it to you. How long you got? No, I just go do it. So you, you, don't, I, so, you don't want to hear my explanation. So we have in the store, in yeah. the Trinity Radio on Teespring, we have the Y t-shirt. It just yeah. says Why? And uh, Eddie Vasquez has one and says it's a great conversation starter. Why? No, but why? <laughs> yeah. No, um, I'm just saying. I, this, this, we're never going to get through this guy. Yeah, but I'm sorry. Because I said so, sometimes is a great answer. Sometimes that's the answer. And if it does kill the questions, it saves your sanity as a parent. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It wasn't an answer. It was a way to end the conversation. That's, that's right. The same thing as God did it. Or no. God will take care of it. It's a cop out. No. Your kids are born curious. As it's they not a cop out important. because that God did something doesn't explain how. You can still go into the curiosity of how that came to be. I did. No, it's not the same thing. You got to love Slam RN. Yeah. Stop, stop spamming the chat with repeated dumb statements. <laughs> That's a Jonathan Pritchett comment. There right you there. go. Gregory Fisher, thank you for that super chat. Keep it up. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Gregory Fisher, we love you. Yeah. Just the way you are. All right, let's keep going. A lot of them lose that spirit, partly because we discourage them from asking Name so many three. Questions. What? A lot of these kids lose that. Name three. Lose what? That spirit of curiosity and stuff, because you just say God did it, and that's not an answer to anything. Name, name three. Well, you need to actually provide people with some level of rigorous education, or else they get curious enough that they end up with these sorts of ideas. Right. Let's give them more opportunities to discover things for themselves. I shouldn't have said that. That was mean. That was mean, Hemet Meta. How did I, I but, apologize? But Hem, but Hem, Please forgive me. Yeah, forgive him, but not me. I'm not asking for it. Why do you think this kills anything? Have you been around a lot of people to, to confirm this? Or are you just riffing? Because it has never, in my experience, led to any of this. Yeah. Right. Hey, Layman's Tech Lounge actually has some good advice here. I tell my kids they can ask why after they answer, yes, sir, and do whatever they were told to do. So if I ask my kids to do something, they say, yes, sir, they go do it. And then I say, now, do, would you like to know why I asked you to do that? That's pretty good. And by then they probably don't care. Yeah, that, <laughs> they don't that's wanna, a, that's they the go, tactic. They want right to go play, yeah. right? They don't <laughs> care anymore. As annoying as it might be, your kids asking why is really a wonderful thing because it means they want to know stuff. Yeah, Christians believe all this. Yeah, Christ Christians don't deny this. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay. There we one. go. Curiosity. Your kids will trust you more. Kids will believe anything you tell them, at least at first. If you want to develop a stronger bond with your child, lying doesn't help. Because okay, presuming that a Christian parent raising a Christian kid is lying to them. I mean, people on the internet play really fast and loose with two words, dishonest and lying, both of which speak to your intent. How do you know that I'm intentionally telling them something that's not true, whatever the subject? Yeah, I'm just going to say this so that you don't have to, and they can clip me out and you'll be spared this. Hemet, you're a liar. Christianity is true. Christian apologists for 2,000 years have refuted everything any of you people have tried to bring from the atheist to every other religion in the world. We keep shooting it down because the truth is the truth and Christianity is true. So stop lying to people. There you go. Well, the presuppositionalists will certainly agree with you that it's a I'm lie. not anti-presuppositionalist. And, and, and you will be clipped there are out, things but not that they're by right me. About. You will be clipped out. There are things, I don't mind, I've said it many times in this program, don't mind presuppositions. There are things they are right about. One thing that they are right about is that Christianity is true and it's impossible for it to be false. You will be clipped out, but not by me. It'll be by someone who wants to make that its own video. Yeah. And they really yeah, I'm sorry, but you guys have been refuted. It's done. Christianity is true. So now y'all are just lying to people. The theme of the show today, Jesus wins. All they're atheists lying. are lying all the time. Right? No. Can we? Do, no, this is what they do. Why not? Because I'm not doing that. It, well, I'm. Just, I think most of them. Are, I don't hey, know. he is treating me right. How I want to be. How he thinks I oh, want to be treating, treated. Yeah, so the platinum this is, rule. Right. So I'm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Happy. Okay. Roddy Tucker. I love you, man. Roddy fine. Tucker. Thank you so much. What are you just? Did your wife know what you give? 
to shows. Thank yeah. you so much. Greetings, guys. Have a coffee and lunch on me. Got the framed page of Paley's Natural Theology the other day. Thanks. For who? Awesome. Awesome. That is so, oh. Thank you. Bless you. May Love your children Rodney. rise up. I hope up you're feeling you better. Blessing. hope that shoulder's healing up and all the other stuff, man. I know. We've been praying for Rodney. I don't know what you think is silly bearded beard slap radio, but I agree with you. All right, let's let's go ahead with this now. They'll make a mental note not to take you seriously in the future. Telling them the Bible is true then is going to be a problem the moment they find a contradiction or realize there's no way the world was created in six days or understand people don't rise up from the dead outside of zombie movies. Just because you mean well doesn't mean your kids will come around to your way of thinking. Okay, number one, you're presuming that those things are false to make your point. Yeah. Secondly, uh, it's not as though Christians don't have varying opinions about that, uh, about the six days of creation. Right. Don't say, don't tell your kids about God because you'd be lying to. Yeah, that's, that's like saying, don't tell your kids there is no God because you're lying to them. God exists, and Christianity is true, and God raised Jesus from the dead, and then everyone else is going to have a resurrection at the Pharisees. I mean, so stop lying, atheists. Come on, this is not how... Learn, they they call him the friendly atheist. This small. is not a way to communicate in any way for me to take you seriously. Uh, you tell me what I should and should You want me to... He wants us religious people to take him seriously and consider what he's saying. Well... Don't lie to your kids because that's what you're inclined to do. Well, that's not going to really warm people up too, <laughs> too well. So, Especially when you have people like me who are saying, no, you're the liar. Let God be true and every man a liar, right? I'm never going to come to you for the big things. Sometimes we have to say Christian stuff on apologetics. I know some atheists who apologize. honestly feel conflicted about introducing their kids to the idea of Santa Claus for that very reason. I mean, I do it. It's fun for me. I'm playing by his rules more than he is. I didn't teach my kids about Santa Claus. Sorry if if you have any kids in the room. I, I In fact, you might want to go ahead and pause this and watch it later if you have kids in the room because I'm about to blow the lid off of a great conspiracy. There was your moment to do that. It's on you after this. But I taught my kids. I, when my kids first asked me is Santa... Re I don't even think I waited. I just told them, you know, Santa Claus is just for fun, right? But this is all about Jesus and that's real. I did that early on. I always taught my kids the truth. Now, I don't like begrudge people that do. It's just that I didn't want to play that. I, I, the very thing he's talking about, that they would think that I had deceived them intentionally. Whether it really is that big a deal or not, I went over and above, and, and we still have a fun time. We still, Santa's still a part of it. Is that We're not one of those you know, families that like doesn't have a Christmas tree in the house or uh, doesn't have Santa Claus stuff. And we, we're all for that, just like Mickey Mouse or you know whatever. It, it's a part of culture. But... We make sure that is clearly separated in their thinking from the truth about the nature of reality, which yeah. is the Christian faith. Jesus is Lord of Santa. Yeah. All right. Yes, Jesus Santa is, is Lord. a Christian in our house. <laughs> he is a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I get where they're coming from. Even yeah, I don't need you to tell me. The point is, I'm already doing what he wants me to do more than he's doing what he wants me to do. Right. Where is it? I lost it. There it is. But still gets credit. Where is it? Where's what? I, I hate doing it this way. It's so unprofessional. I know. But you know what? There, there's the it's challenge, the assumption thing. is a that good thing. For? And what that is say? tempting as a parent because trust me, there are so many times I wish my kids would just shut up and listen to me. But if an adult does something that doesn't make sense to them, I want kids to push back. Okay. I want them to ask questions. Ch I challenging authority here. So, mm -hmm. he, now, oh he, yeah, challenging he, authority. He, he, th this goes both ways, okay? Because when I got to my philosophy class at Middle Tennessee State University, and there was one Christian kid up there, one like hardcore Christian. Now, I was enough of an introvert still at that point in my life that I wasn't going to be asking any questions of a philosophical nature in front of a jury of my peers. But the kid up on the front, he was not an introvert. He had his ichthus hat on it said jesus and t christian t-shirt from some dopey camp he went the to blood and, all that. Wiser t -shirt. And, and he said everything that i yeah something like that derivative <laughs> christian and he said everything that i wanted him to say yeah. and and he was marginalized in the class and and, and and thought of as a weirdo and made to be 
thought, you know, because he was challenging the authority of the professor of the class. So this goes both ways. I don't want them to do things just because an authority figure told them to do it. If they think they know better. Plus, we're living in a culture now where if you go against the authorities on social media, I mean, I'm, I'm about to, I'm, I got, I'm, I'm that close to this becoming a political show. <laughs> but I'm going to resist the urge. Please do. Let them speak up. Just because someone's a pastor Just doesn't follow the mean science, Braxton. he knows everything or that he's always telling the truth. Pretend that means something. Same with parents. But no one raises kids to hold up citation needed signs in church. Actually, in Sean McDowell's latest book with Jay Warner Wallace, they do point out that now you better know that everything you're saying in church is being fact checked because kids have phones right there in the pew and they will fact check everything that you're saying or you're poor brett and you have seminary professors sitting in yeah your, so in your church but, i mean like if you're a pastor out there and you've got that you're using sermon illustrations or giving statistics or whatever just know there's an army of people out there with phones that are fact checking it. yeah so i, I don't would yeah. not be a bad idea you can avoid indoctrination if you're religious okay here's where i'm gonna make my speech that i did this for it's not going to be long, but here's what I want you to hear me say. You are going to indoctrinate your kids on some level. Everyone will. Because, number one, Hemet Meta is trying to indoctrinate me right now. But secondly, on a soft understanding of indoctrination. But secondly, uh, there was a guy in another video I was looking at, and he's like, look, we don't just teach them Christianity in our house. We're an atheist household. We show them Christianity, the Bible here. We've got the Quran. We've got the Book of Mormon. We've got whatever. Um, and, he, and he's like, we go, we look at all that stuff, which I'm, I really wonder how much of a deep dive they're going into on the, uh, you know, the Dhammapada or something. But it, the thing about it is um, we go through all of that stuff, and we, we, uh, we reveal all this about ancient Greek stuff. And Listen to me. My kid, my oldest daughter is a Greek God's geek. That's a tongue twister. She knows everything about Athena and Artemis. I mean, when I was over in Turkey and we had the, in Ephesus, the temple of Artemis there and everything, I could have called her to get answers about what I should put in the script because she knows all that stuff. We teach our kids that stuff. She knew that it was all make believe. It's like the Avengers. She knows that. Um, but, but, but the idea that we don't teach that, but here's the thing. No matter what you teach your kids or how spread out or how you think you're teaching them critical thinking skills so that then they can form their own ideas about it, your ki the, the family setup is a setup. The parent-child relationship is set up to communicate worldviews from one generation to the next. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. Here's why. Unless you're a horrible parent, unless you're abusive or something, or neglectful or absentee, your kids are going to think you're a rock star, at least during the formative years of their life. They're going to think you're awesome. They're going to want to be like you. And so as a result of that, what they're going to want to do, what they're going to figure out what your worldview is. Are you going to hide it from them? Are they not going to notice that you've got five copies of the God delusion so that you can give away four of them to people when you do your atheist evangelism? Do you not think they know that you're in there making a YouTube video about atheism and hearing it through the door? You don't think they overhear your conversations with other friends or on the phone or whatever else. They know what your worldview is and they're going to be disposed toward that because they know you're into that and they want to do what you want to do. They want to believe what you believe, at least at first. And so you're going to end up indoctrinating them, whether you like it or not, because that is the nature of the parent-child relationship. So what you need to do is, I agree we teach them critical thinking skills. I agree we give them the whole ball of wax, which we're going to find out before this video is done. And of course, the title of his video is, Don't Tell Your Kids About God. Actually, restrict information from them. Um, but we want to tell them the whole ball of wax and teach them all those things. But make sure what we're indoctrinating them with is correct. Because if you're going to indoctrinate someone with something, you want to make sure that you're giving them good nourishment. End of rant. You missed a couple of super chats. Well, I, you know, I had to do what I had to do. Man. Marvelous. 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 <laughs> says, I was raised in a cult that downplays free thinking, but I still ended up in an extremely curious person, almost like his point is baseless. Thank you. I agree. That was marvelous. Yes. Marvelous, marvelous. And then there uh, again. 
Derek Baylor says the only difference between indoctrination and education is whether the accuser agrees with what's being taught. That's one way to look at it. And you know, but, but again, I want to highlight that people are going to say that the difference about indoctrination is that you're, you're that it can't be questioned what's being said, but that is a particular definition of indoctrination. Yeah. Um, the, the, very the only meaning of it. Yeah. Right. Um, and now there was someone down here. Oh, I can't believe Jason. Wow. Miles. Didn't you do this last week? Jason miles, Jason miles. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Blessings on yes. you. I so appreciate it. I'm just blown away by this. I just, it's unbelievable. Man. Unbelievable. I, you know, when we used to do this show, Bridget, just pause this for a second. Cause it's already paused. When we used to do this show down the hall in a different room, before we understood how to live stream, we were just recording ourselves talking. Yeah. We didn't realize the community and fun and encouragement that could come yes. with something like this. What did I do to my, uh, what did I do? There we go. I didn't think I liked this color spread, but I think I'm digging it. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, let's keep going with this now. This and you want your kids to be religious indoctrinating them is a horrible way to do it because the backlash could be huge. I would say that. Oh, actually, I missed one. Justin Brown says, there's a new believer in the chat who asks how to be born again, what it means. Can you address that? Sorry, it's super off topic. It's never off topic on Trinity nope, Radio. Nope, that's what we're about. So um, whoever you are, first of all, thank you for being here. We're glad you found the channel. And I want you to know that um, that subject, uh, people, being born again and coming to know who Jesus is and starting a relationship with him and adopting the Christian faith is actually what I'm fundamentally interested in. Defending it and demonstrating that it's true is secondary to me. The most important thing is to present the message of the Bible, to present the message of the Christian faith. So first of all, um, this language of born again comes from John chapter three, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, uh, it says uh, uh, Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night and um, he asked him who he was that could do the, same, the things that Jesus did because this person has to be from God to do all the things that Jesus does. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, he takes it hyper literally, and he's like, can a man crawl back into his mother's womb a second time and be born? And he's uh, and Jesus, you know, reveals to him that you, you're what you're saying, like you're supposed to be a ruler in, in Israel and you don't even understand these things. And the notion is this is kinship language um, where you, you're a, you're being adopted into a new family. You're, you're a part of a new family and indeed a new kingdom. And that is the kingdom of God. You are born into it. Um, and baptism kind of pictures that and pictures you dying to your old way of life being born again into this new life. But baptism isn't what saves you. Uh, baptism isn't the way you become a Christian. The most important thing to understand is that we have all done things that are wrong. We've all sinned against God. We call that sin when you do something wrong and, and you do what God doesn't want. And as a result of that, because God is a good God, he must be just. He must dispense justice. He must do the just thing. And so there must be some punishment. Um, and so what Jesus did, what God did through that was he sent his son to die on a cross to take that punishment for us so that we could be born again and spend uh, eternity with with God. And so you might say, well, yeah, but how do I? How, OK, so I know that everybody does stuff that's wrong and I know that there's a punishment for that and I know that I need to be born again. How do I do that? Well, uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Now, there's two things there. Number one, you've got to you've got to believe that it's true and trust it. And then you've got to confess it. And, and that doesn't just mean that you've got to verbally confess it, although I think you should do that. What we're talking about here is that you actually are committing to it. You're not just believing that it's true. You're committing your life to this. The Bible elsewhere says you repent. That means to turn from your life without Jesus to a life with Jesus, to turn from your sin. And so simply put, we're all sinners. Jesus died to take your place. Being born again is entering that new kingdom, that kingdom of all believers, and to be born into a new family. And when that happens, the Spirit will be a part of your life and, and indwell your life. 
But the most important thing is if you understand you're a sinner and that Jesus died for you because of those sins, then what the next step should be for you is to tell the Lord that you want to be a part of that kingdom, that you want to turn from your sins. And uh, you can do that in prayer. There's no magic formula. There's no magic series of words that makes you saved. But I think it's appropriate to tell the Lord that you recognize that you're a sinner, that you're turning from that life without him. And you're turning to Jesus. And if you if that's really what's on your heart, then the Bible teaches you will. Romans 10, 9 says you will be saved. That's the part God does. There's no question about it. You will be born again and we'll welcome you as a new brother or a new sister. So I hope that's helpful. And uh, the good thing about this is this is a video, so you can go back and play it as many times as you need. But I'm praying for you. In fact, I'm going to pray right now that, that God will lead you in that process. Father, thank you for this person that is in the chat today, and I pray that you would lead them uh, to the right decision. Now, this would not just be a desire for more information, but that this desire for more information would lead to an, a, a point of action in their lives where they come to know you and commit to you. We ask you that, Lord, that you would give them the conviction of the Spirit, that they would do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So there's that. And if anyone does that, if anyone commits their life to Christ, let us know. Um, you can contact us at Braxton at TrinityRadio.org. All right. Um, we just got a thumbs down for praying and sharing the gospel. That's okay. Figures. That's okay. We, we can expect that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, Stefan A's, and if I'm missing super chats, I'm so sorry, but thank you for this super chat says, how would you respond to Catholic miracles like visions of Mary and Eucharistic miracles? Well, I would want to take them on a case by case basis. Now I'm not an atheist. I'm open to miracles and I believe that miracles occur. Or so supernatural events. I, would, and, I, I wouldn't be dismissive of miracles that take place in a Catholic concept context just because they're Catholic um, with Marian apparitions or appearances of Mary and things like that. Um, I would want to know, is this something that we can, we can demonstrate in some way really is Mary as opposed to just an angelic appearance or, or not real at all, you know um, but I'm not close to it. So that would be kind of my first response. And I've been meaning to watch that documentary about the miracle at Fatima. So I haven't gotten to do that yet. Pritchett, did you see that? Nope. MJ Jackson, we mentioned you earlier. Thank you for showing up in the chat. We Good love afternoon. You. And we're not done here yet, folks. Don't don't leave us. It's just we need to get good. done before Winger comes on. He's yeah, long do. since built our chat. Probably so. He's probably getting um, ready for. Uh, his show. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So this is why we do have like no topic shows for Q and A. Is him at Meta here? It look, someone said that he was spamming the super chat. I don't, but I don't think that's right. Well, I don't see him here. Well. Um, all right, Jamie Russell, thank you for that. Thank you for what you guys are doing. Appreciate that, Jamie Russell. You're a big encouragement. All right, let's get back to this now. We're, we're almost done. Atheists, kind of. too. The most outspoken atheists I know come from some of the most religious families, and some very famous Christians came out of very non-religious homes. Yeah, like Madeline Murray O'Hara, the hate, most hated woman in America, is the name of that documentary, but her son is a Bible-thumping Christian, so um, you don't the woman who got prayer out of schools... And she had a voice to do that because of her son, who's now a Christian. I want kids to believe something is right or good just because they're used to it from you. Richard Dawkins has made this point before, but we Thanks, all Finding accept Truth. that it would be absurd for a parent to say, this is my newborn baby. She's a Republican. Like, what? <laughs> no, she's a baby. She doesn't have political thoughts. And yet parents... Well, you know, we don't baptize infants. I realize we got Catholics and Presbyterians in the chat, but we, um, and not all Presbyterians do that, but, but we don't baptize infants. So I don't know if this kind of goes past Lutherans, us. Methodists, yeah. Anglicans, do that Latin. all the time with religion. This child is getting back. We, we, Dr. Pritchett and I, we affirm a believer's baptism. So when the child gets to the point where they themselves affirm their faith in Christ, that's when baptism takes place. Right, but I still have no problems calling my infant a Christian insofar as my child is a member of a Christian family where we identify as Christian in a Christian community of believers in the church. And until um, they go uh, and re renounce it or whatever, I'm just going to treat them as such until they make their own public confession of faith. But, you know... I'm not going to treat them as if they weren't a Christian. So I have right, no problem yeah. saying my my little infant here, that's a Christian baby. But and and even with belief, with infant baptism, my understanding from at least um, 
<clears throat> like uh, certain Presbyterian groups that do that, is that it it, it functions there very much like um, like when we do a baby dedication day kind of thing. Uh, it's acknowledging the, them as a covenant member that doesn't necessarily mean that they're saved. Because mm-hmm. he's a Catholic. He's a good Muslim child. That kid doesn't know what's going on. Give him some space to figure it out. Don't saddle him with a label he didn't choose. Kids should learn how to challenge their own preconceptions. What's all this should and better and all these value statements and 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 obligatory statements? We always want our kids to just become miniature versions of ourselves. But in terms of beliefs... Man, I hope my kids don't become miniature Right, do you want your daughter's bald? I knew, beard? <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say you that. Like you your trust your kids, to, yeah. and your beliefs are well-grounded. Maybe they'll come around and see things your way, and they'll do Or bearded. I don't want my daughter's bearded right. either. No, I, look, they, I, I don't... I don't... I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to pick on Alabama, folks. I'm not. But I, where are the, the Christians that he's... Thinking this happens, or it sounds like you think uh, in Alabama, <laughs> or maybe he, th- yeah. But I, I'm just saying I don't know where any of this comes from. Like as if he's never spent time with any Christian neighbors, you know. Seriously, I get that there are, I, I you know, the the YouTube channels that like focus on that sort of thing. Maybe that is, maybe they're doing what they're doing because they happen to be in that group of Christians that are like that. Now okay? I've hung out. So I'm going to give you that, but n- Christians in general are not doing these things. Right. And I've actually hung out with some atheists, right? Atheist parents. And I'm sorry. It's not just a bunch of beard stroking high, you know, ivory tower, lofty conversations going on about ideas all day long. No, no, you're, they're not They're. It's, you know, there's, there's no sort of, non-indoctrination going on there's no sort of polar opposite of what he's saying we shouldn't do those you know some of their kids have no problem with their christian neighbors either and you know they don't want their yeah hey we're go- we're we're going to continue this we're all we really are almost done but why don't y'all subscribe to this channel for goodness sakes there's a lot of you all that watch this channel that are not subscribers come on now if you're here this long you've gotten some value out of it for yeah. themselves not because it- I'm not being myself today. I am. Is this how I am always? You've been increasingly becoming more yeah, like you. Yes. <laughs> on them. But even if they don't, so what? Raise your kids to be decent people and then let them forge their own path, even if it's not the one you would have chosen. It encourages doubt. Religion offers so many wrong answers to so many good questions. Assertion. What else is out there? How did we get here? Evolution and cosmology, just to name two subjects, are fascinating, partly because there are so many aspects of those subjects we just don't know. Not yet. But you should believe every bit of it. But that's okay. Even though we don't know much about it, just believe it because, you know, follow the science. Kit Horton, thank you for that super chat. As long as it's science indoctrinating you with maybes, that's what you should believe, but... He but says, I'm a Sunday school teacher at an IFB church from Alabama. The stereotype atheists typically attack is real. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Derek kidding. Baylor says, I'm a subscriber and a patron. Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sunglasses emoji. That's honest. You almost never hear a pastor say, you know, God doesn't really have a position on this issue. You know what you will hear? The Bible's not clear on that topic. Yeah. Which is basically to say the same thing. Right. I mean, it's not not to say that God doesn't have a position. God does have a position, but I don't know what it is because the Bible's not clear about it. You hear that all the time. Right. Listen. Except in Kid Horton's church. Go to like a Hardee's in a small town or a, or a suburb of your community on uh, any particular morning, and, and it won't take very long before you'll find a group of preachers sitting there eating godless, unhealthy food. And go up to them and ask them these questions directly. Because there will be like one guy who acts like this, like he's saying, but there will be some real humility there too. No, God always has an answer for everything. Amen. (laughs) And it always seems to coincide with whatever the pastor thinks. Or maybe what the pastor thinks coincides with what he understands God thinks. Right. 
And even when it makes no sense at all, religious people will just say, God is working in mysterious ways. I've heard that phrase more from atheists in my life than I have from uh, Christians. Yeah. It's okay to say we don't know what's happening. That's life. Uncertainty is part of it. Let's teach our kids not to accept a bad answer just to fill a void. They're not old enough. They'll learn about God eventually. I'm not saying we should shelter them from religion. Of course, they should learn about different beliefs because well, you are saying we should shelter them from religion right. to a certain po- to a certain age. How old were you when you got saved, Braxton? Five years old. Your parents were talking to you about big ideas like yeah. God and justice and yes. mercy and forgiveness and sin and holy all these big ideas at five. No, I don't have you. I no, you have, can't. No, we want you to be a stupid five-year-old. Don't talk to your kids about this stuff. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Religion is a driving force in our world, and they need to know how to communicate with friends and classmates who are believers. They're going to make friends with kids who are religious. Yeah, you want your kid to be behind the curve because these kids important. are going to be exposed to these ideas that but you just imagine don't need to talk if- to your kids about kids weren't introduced to religion until they were much older. Teenagers, even. What if one day you said, I want to tell you about how a virgin gave birth to the Lord, who once walked on water, and later got tortured, but then got resurrected. And that's we tell that story Easter- every year on Christmas and Easter, for sure. It's yeah, a great but he's story. saying, wait until your kids get older, and then they'll automatically reject that. But, of course, you just gave, like, the the most truncated explanation here's do do you think God exists? That's a sensible question. And if the answer to that is yes, then the next question is, okay, do you think that miracles are possible? Like if there's a God can create a universe from nothing. Do you think that miracles are possible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that God would want to communicate with mankind if he made us? Yeah. Well, probably. Oh, well, there's actually someone who uh, that may have happened with who happens to be a part of the, you know, this massive religion <laughs> that seems to, right. okay. So, uh, could God have raised him from the dead? If God created you? Yeah. Okay. It, it's, it, you know, you can get the God things. who brought everything into existence from absolutely nothing that you believe in. Do what scientists do to virgins now, except without the tools. Right. Well, and, and can, can he pull that off? Is that so, I mean, he pulled off the creation of everything, a- including, uh, the foundations for science to be able to do in vitro, but can God in, can can God cause through the Holy Spirit a virgin to get pregnant? You think that's possible? I mean, creation. I know that that's one thing, but this virgin birth business. Whoa. Or don't tell your kids. Don't shelter your kids from quantum physics. Yeah. But wait until they're let's say teenagers, and then tell them that uh, scientists have discovered that certain particles just seem uh, to. Uh, uh, that seem to pop into one area rather than another and the wave form collapses into a position and it seems like there's no explain to them about quantum entanglement they're going to think that sounds ridiculous too if you haven't given them the platform to get to that point or you show them a really cool video made for kids that illustrate those things because you don't need to hide this stuff from kids when they're young you just give it to them at the level that's appropriate to their age and you deepen it and thicken it as they get older but you don't withhold it, and then throw them into the deep end of the pool. Just notice that we're here, two Christians, saying we teach our kids Greek uh, about the Greek gods, and we teach our kids about atheism and evolution and, and all physics. that kind of stuff. And you got this atheist on the screen saying, don't keep that secret knowledge away from them <laughs> right. until they're a certain age. <laughs> right. Funny. Oh, and by the way, some people think eating a wafer means you are literally eating the body of Jesus. Literally. If your kids still take religion seriously. You hear that, you Catholics in the chat? Yeah. He's aiming at you. After all that. Catholics in Alabama. They can be religious. But more often. Yeah, yeah. Now, no, hold up here. Now, hold on. Oh, uh, buddy, that name. Dekalo Shidada said, I'm not making fun of your name. I'm making fun of my inability to, to pronounce your name. Don't people get saved at an older age? Yes. People do sometimes get get saved at an and older age. And contrary to the popular opinion, people actually get saved at an older age because of apologetics, too. Yep. Even though atheists seem to think that these people don't exist, no matter how many letters we read. But and not They accept those stories just because they're used to them. 
religious belief, like sex education, doesn't make sense until they reach an age where they have at least some clue about what people are talking about. And like sex, they should know how to do it safely. It's unfair to push your beliefs. You need to learn how to do religion safely. <laughs> that, that's when they've what never had a chance to think through it. Especially when we're talking about smaller religions that demand... So him is going to go protest all of this sex ed and... I was uh, thinking that very thing. All this stuff for, for second graders. I, I look forward to that video. Yes. Get, yes. I mean, all this stuff about... Uh, oh, I can't even talk about it. We'll get kicked off. Don't get political, but... Yeah. But, but yeah. Uh, we making, will look forward to his video on all this right. stuff. He can, he's... If he ever received an education, I don't know if he's giving us, uh, you know, maybe he came late to the party. But now that you at least seem to be informed about all this, be consistent. We'll, we'll wait for your video protesting sexual education to grade school kids. And since you specified that the religious kids should hear about it when they're teenagers, let's go ahead and say at least 13. Yeah, that would be progress. Right. Or from belief. Better yet, let their parents do it. It can cause a lot of damage. They deserve hell. Have you been around babies? Okay, what you're about to hear is an attempt at humor that I think if you're an atheist, you know, there's a lot of atheists that talk about they're traumatized by the concept of hell, even now that they're atheists. And there are a lot of Christians, of course, who think or who are serious about the doctrine of hell. So I don't know who this joke is aimed at, that it's not in horribly poor taste. They can be evil, annoying, smelly. Babies. I mean, they kind of deserve hell. So, you know, maybe don't tell them they about God. They deserve hell and, because like, they're annoying and smell. See what happens. Yeah, that's He not... says, Let's, so just don't tell them about hell and see what happens. Look, you may think that answer is cruel, but I swear you will agree with me the next time they're crying at 3 a.m. is all I'm saying. They should go to hell, he says. Right, he says they should go to hell for being smelly babies. Ladies I mean, and gentlemen, yeah. friendly atheists. That's right. Babies deserve hell, not for wicked sins that they'll commit later in life, but, you know, they deserve hell because they smell bad and that they're annoying. Talk about having... Sounds a little bit like uh, the thing that he was protesting earlier. They're just worthless. Babies, horrible. Well, there's the... Uh, uh, look, in the end... The what he's what he's trying to say here is this hell business, you know, that's that's bad. Don't 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 teach your kids about hell until you know whatever. Yeah, I I, I love babies. I'm ready for grandbabies, but I'm I'm willing to wait until my two younger ones are uh, married before they give me grandbabies. But I do have my oldest son is married, and I'm ready for him to get on with it. I so want, I want grandbabies. You hear that, Zach? Kendall? Give me a stinky, annoying baby that Hamet thinks should go to hell. Because I don't think that. Atheist morality. So here's what I want to say here at the end. And Bridget, you can pile on if you want to. But... Um, yeah, put that comment up there. Because I know that Hamet's not... This is not what he's saying, but that's where it comes from, Right? What? That. This? That. See that it, but below it. See, that is atheist morality. Babies deserve hell for being inconvenient. They couldn't produce pleasure in the expected quantities, so they must be worthless and in. I don't think that's and fair. aborted that's... and all of this stuff. No, not like I said. That's they don't think they should go to hell really. No, they don't believe in hell, but the point is, it's what he his point is in the comments is indicative of a culture that celebrates the fact that let's kill him. Yeah, if it, yeah. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's let's be done with this now. Can I can I wind down? Yeah. Okay. I won't say I won't stop you. <laughs> well, okay. Look, if you believe, Pastor Mark said this at the beginning. The very first comment in the super chat, I think. If a parent believes a particular thing is true and extremely important, then they're a bad parent if they don't pass that on to their kids. We happen to believe that Christianity represents the truth about the nature of reality. You don't believe that. That's that's okay. It's not fine. You should believe it, but we do believe it. And so we're going to teach our kids that. 
And the idea that you don't like that and the excuse you use is that we're indoctrinating our kids. Everyone indoctrinates their kids. Everyone indoctrinates their kids. If you're using the definition no, of indoctrination that requires that, it's teaching them stuff without their ability to challenge it or ask questions. I don't know anyone who does that. I'm sure there are Christians who do that. I'm sure there are atheists who do that. What we should do is teach our kids, love our kids. You know, it reminds me of, um, there was a cosmic skeptic video where he was talking about his fear of hell. And he said, you know, um, education is the most important thing. Uh, and it's an abuse not to educate kids about this and that and the other. No, education is not the most important thing. Being nice is not the most important thing. Love is the most important thing. If you would love your kids, if you give them what they need most, which is love, then you'll educate them properly and you'll do your best to make sure that what you're educating them with is the truth and it's good mental and, and educational nourishment for them. And you'll also be nice when you should be nice. But the idea that someone who has no access, has no foundation for any kind of morality would tell us what we should do and that this way is better. The way that teaches you that there is no ultimate foundation for an obligation or obligatory terminology, duty to terminology like better, worse, good, bad is ridiculous to me. So you stick with Jesus and the theme of the day is Jesus wins. Right, Bridget? That's right. What else do you have to say? Nothing. You don't have anything else to say? No. Were your feelings hurt somewhere? No. All right. I'm just, I, I don't know. Videos like this bug me because someone was like, this is the friendly atheist and all that. Just because you call yourself the friendly atheist and you say, you're all lying to people in a way like that instead of, y'all liars are. I, it's a facade. Not buying it. Sorry, Hammett. Just your stick. No, it's a it's a stick. Your stick. I don't I don't care for it. Uh, I think videos like that are absolute nonsense. They are filled with nonsense and should be ignored except for uh, the critiques that we give it, which is all the airing it needs. All right. Well, we appreciate that you all have been with us today. We love you, everyone. Hey, we got a super chat there. Roger Sharp. No Roger way. Sharp. Not the Roger the Sharp. The Roger Sharp. Oh, man. I'm so glad you're here, Roger Sharp. That's what's his name. Married to Mary Jo, right? Mary Jo Sharp. <laughs> I wasn't going to say Mary what's Jo Sharp's name? husband, but he doesn't no. care. No, I'll... Roger Sharp. Pair Love character Roger jumping Sharp. up and down saying number one fan. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate it. I enjoyed our time together in Israel. I have never met you in person, but I hope to one day. Oh, that's too loud. He's awesome. All right. Well, we're going to go, but we'll be watching the chat for the he next few minutes. He can teach me to sing. And uh, we thank you all so much for today. And we're here every Friday at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. We look forward to seeing you here next time on Trinity Radio.